Today I'm taking you on a trip through the most mysterious ancient civilizations around the world. The cities of Egypt. Now let's visit some of the best left over from the intense and busy past of ancient Egypt. Ancient Egypt was not home to a single civilization. There were various civilizations that developed along the edge of the Nile River. In fact, when Egypt started out it was divided in half. There was Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt, two totally separate entities. It took centuries for Egypt to unite as a single kingdom. Today I want to tell you about some of the greatest cities of ancient Egypt and how they differed from one another. Each city was home to its own culture and its own gods. The city of Thebes was one of the most impressive cities ever built by human hands. It was known as the city of Amun during the New Kingdom between 1570 and 1069 BC. Amun was the creator god in early Egypt, the deity responsible for creating humanity itself. Amun was positioned on the east bank of the Nile in what is now the city of Luxor. You can still see the epic temples and spectacular buildings that were established by the pharaohs who ruled Thebes for hundreds of years. This was the great city of famous rulers like Ramesses II and King Tut. It's also where the Valley of the Kings can be found, that desert gorge riddled with lost tombs of forgotten kings. A lot of these places could rival modern cities today. The city of Nubt was an essential trade city but lacked the splendor of a place like Thebes. It was from Nubt where much of the agriculture in ancient Egypt was practiced. Food necessary to feed the entire kingdom came from this region. Its people were unique in that they primarily worshipped the crocodile god Sobek. The city was also close to gold deposits which likely helped the farmers become even richer. The city is most famous today for its temple of Kom Obo, built about 2100 years ago. As you can see, ancient Egypt required different cities to serve different purposes. A place like Thebes was the seat of power, while Nubt was where the food came from. Then there was the city of Elephantine, which very few people have ever heard of before. Have you heard of it? Elephantine was a defensive city, positioned right on the edge of Egypt and Nubia. The powerful stronghold of Elephantine was a bulwark against the people to the south. The defenders who lived within its strong walls gave praise to the water god Knum. Now, you might be wondering about the pyramids, or maybe you already know which ancient city is associated with the Great Pyramids of Giza. I'll give you a hint, the city wasn't called Giza. It was Memphis, the first known capital of ancient Egypt. Memphis was the grandest city on the Nile starting in 2950 BC. Some historians even think Memphis was the biggest and most advanced city in the world 5,000 years ago. For almost a millennium, Memphis stood in the shadow of the pyramids. It was a primary center of worship for many gods, including Ptah and his wife Sekhmet. By the time Alexandria was founded in 332 BC, Memphis was in ruins and the pyramids were totally neglected. The Almec and the Mysteries of the Third Eye You've heard of the Maya and you've heard of the Aztec, but long before either of those civilizations existed, the Olmec ruled the jungles of Mexico. The Olmecs were the first real civilization in Mesoamerica. Their origins are mysterious. Nobody quite knows where they came from or what happened to them. It's also unknown what exactly the Olmecs did during their thousand years of rule. One hypothesis states that they understood the secrets of the Third Eye. The best place to start is at the very beginning, or at least what scholars believe to be the very beginning. The general consensus is that the beginning of the Olmec civilization was around the year 1500 BC, then they only lasted around 900 years. By 400 BC, the Olmecs were all gone. I mean, really gone. Vanished. Disappeared. Poof. There is only speculation to explain what happened. Maybe there was a catastrophic incident like a volcanic eruption. They may have grown overpopulated and ran out of food. It's a persistent mystery that scientists are helpless to solve. But the Olmec didn't vanish without a trace. The Olmec people left some seriously recognizable artifacts scattered across their homeland. There are about 20 colossal heads that have been found across four different sites in Mexico. The colossal heads were shaped from solid basalt boulders, which themselves were taken from the Sierra de los Tuxtlas. Much like the mystery of how the massive stones were transported to Stonehenge in England, experts also don't know how the Olmec did it either. These were seriously heavy boulders that were moved across great expanses of jungle and coastland. Then they were molded into beautifully decorated human heads. 
One of the first researchers to study the Olmec was Matthew Sterling. He helped scientists learn that the colossal heads were shaped using ordinary tools, things like hammer stones and abrasive materials. But there's one more thing I want to mention about the stone heads. Some of them appear to have been crafted with a small indent on their forehead that corresponds to the location of the third eye. Not all the statues are like this, but a handful of them are. It's been suggested the Olmec were aware of the power of the human pineal gland, aka the third eye. I'm going to digress a little bit here, but it's important if you and I are going to unravel this mystery. The third eye appears all over the Americas. It isn't only something from Hinduist and Buddhist cultures across China and the rest of Asia. The third eye was also an important part of cultures across the Americas. I'm talking about the Olmec, the Maya, the Aztec, and the pre-Inca civilizations in South America. Evidence of an obsession with the third eye has been found in statues and sculptures. It's a common theme to find funerary masks and other such artifacts with a distinctive mark in the center of their forehead and between the eyes. This is almost certainly a representation of the third eye, just like the urna dot seen in cultural relics across the Indian subcontinent. The third eye is a hugely controversial and mysterious subject. In hermetic tradition, it's said humans originally had a third eye in the center of their forehead. But as human beings evolved, the extra eye atrophied. It sank into the human head and morphed into the pineal gland, which every person has right now. The pineal gland is at the geometric center of your brain. Many people believe the eye somehow morphed from looking at the physical world to peering out at the spiritual world. Those who are about to tap into the power of the third eye have greater perception. They have a better ability to heal themselves. Some claim they become clairvoyant or are endowed with some other spiritual power. If the archaeological evidence is anything to go by, the Olmec were totally in tune with this biological yet supernatural human force. And now for number 12, but first it's shout out time. I wanted to give a big thank you to Sunny Strada 8204 and Kevin Warwick 773 for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos like this. The Tarascan. The only civilization that could challenge the Aztec Empire was the Tarascan Empire, at least until the Spanish showed up. The Tarascan controlled a massive kingdom in western Mexico, with their border clashing directly against the border of the Aztec. Wait a minute, there was an empire that rivaled the Aztec? Yes, and almost nobody has heard of them. The Tarascan Empire came from the tribal civilizations of Bahio and Michoacán, who had been dominating western Mexico for 2,000 years. Nobody knows how they got started. Societies likely developed along the shoreline and blossomed into clans. They continued to evolve and advance as human beings until, rather abruptly around 1325 AD, the Tarascan formed an empire. What happened next is what always happens when two civilizations grow too quickly too close to each other. The Aztec and the Tarascan found themselves in direct competition for territory and natural resources. But the two civilizations were evenly matched. There were some scuffles, but neither empire could subdue the other. They fell into an uneasy truce. Then when the Spanish came and utterly decimated the Aztec, the Tarascan acted like nothing was happening. The Aztec pleaded with their neighbors for help against the foreign invaders, but the Tarascan civilization did nothing. In 1522, Spaniards arrived in Michoacán. The Tarascan people agreed to peace and became a vassal state. Gemstones of the Dilmun The sands of the Middle East have swallowed countless civilizations over the last 10 or 12,000 years. Scientists don't even know how many civilizations have been swallowed because the desert sands are so good at erasing cities. But there is one civilization historians have been able to learn much about. The Dilmun civilization lived on a small island off the coast of Kuwait about 4,100 years ago. Dilmun isn't exactly a household name like Rome or Carthage, but it is one of the oldest and most important cultures of the Middle East. It's likely the only reason I'm able to tell you about them is that they were islanders. The ruins of their cities and the evidence of their beliefs were left untouched on an island in what is currently Bahrain. Archaeologists are making new discoveries here all the time. One of the most recent finds was thanks to a group of Danish archaeologists from Mosgard Museum. They found gemstones from 3,500 years ago buried beneath the dust. They also discovered the ruins of a jewelry workshop. According to senior scientist Fleming Hoyland, the jewelry workshop was functional between 1700 and 1600 BC. Inside the ruins were pieces of precious stones that aren't found naturally on the island of Felaka. 
Rather, the stones must have been imported from either India or Pakistan. This shows that even during the Bronze Age, jewels were being transported across vast distances, then processed by skilled jewelers. The Dilmun civilization must have surely had some of the best jewelers in the world. Dilmun was more than just a trading center. It was more than just a hub of commerce that had connections with civilizations across Mesopotamia and the Indus Valley. Dilmun was also a place with its own rich mythology and folklore. It's also incredibly old. There are ancient texts that have been found in Sumer, written in cuneiform, that mention Dilmun. Yet for all its age and prestige, the truth of the civilization is nowhere to be found. It collapsed 3,600 years ago. The Lost People of the Himalayas Scientists have found evidence of a complex civilization living in the Himalayan mountains almost 13,000 years ago. The evidence comes in the form of footprints, footprints that were discovered two decades ago. In 1998, a cluster of footprints were found preserved in the soft mud of the Tibetan Plateau. They were catalogued and stored, but the technology wasn't available to properly date them. It wasn't until now that scientists at the University of Innsbruck were able to confirm the footprints as being roughly 12,600 years old. This is shocking because up until the analysis, it was believed humans didn't live in the Himalayas until 5,200 years ago. It's truly amazing that a single discovery of something as simple as a footprint can change the popular understanding of history. Yet it happens all the time. These footprints have changed how researchers look at the Himalayas. Now they know people lived permanently in what you'd think would be an inhospitable nightmare. Honestly, why would anyone choose to live in the snowy mountains 14,000 feet above sea level? It feels like a terrible choice for survival, with very little available food. The collection of human handprints and footprints was found near Chusang, a village famous for its hydrothermal springs. Scientists say that for the ancient people who lived here to get down from the mountain to the next camp, it would have taken them nearly 50 days of downward climbing. They must have had means for survival. However, scientists don't know what that would have looked like nearly 13,000 years ago. Did they have farms in the snow? Did they breed and eat yet? Scientist Michael Meyer said there could be even older sites hidden in the mountains. There very well may have been an entire prehistoric civilization connected through various camps and cities in the Himalayas. The Lost Pew City-States for a thousand years, there was an epic civilization that ruled the jungles and exotic beaches of Myanmar. But what happened to them? And how did they shape modern Southeast Asia? The people of Pew likely migrated from the foothills of the Himalaya in ancient times. They continued migrating south until they hit the edge of Southeast Asia. With such amazingly fertile farmland, the people of Pew were able to transform their humble villages into megalithic cities. Farmland fed what may have been one of the biggest populations in the world. By 200 BC, the Pew city-states had taken over this slice of humid paradise. What's really remarkable about the Pew is the sheer number of cities they built. As of right now, only 12 of their majestic walled cities have been excavated. One of the biggest cities is the city of Baikthano, populated continuously from 200 years before Christ to 1100 years after Christ's death. The Pew cities typically had moats to keep out potential invaders. Their walls were made of brick and stacked high enough to block out the sun. There were priceless pieces of artwork contained inside, along with treasures from across the world. This was one of the first places where Buddhism arrived from India into Asia, so there were also religious monasteries, and for the ruling class, shining palaces that made the Romans green with envy. The cities were also built in such a way that they never really ended. They were almost all constructed right at the edge of the river, with one suburb melting into the next. This created an unending string of urbanized human habitation along the river Irrawaddy. Now let's talk about relationships. In the first century AD, ambassadors from the Roman Empire arrived. They were looking for easier access to China. This was one of the earliest examples of true globalization. Merchants from both sides wanted desperately to figure out how to connect the two great regions of the Old World. When the Roman ambassadors arrived in Pew, they found an unexpected trading partner. The two empires quickly established a working relationship. This incredible position allowed the Pew to thrive for an incredibly long time. They outlived the Romans, but couldn't escape their fate. According to the historical records, an army of swift horsemen arrived from the north. The horsemen raided Pew territory starting around 763 AD. 
Small raids became larger raids until the few city-states were completely overrun in the beginning of the 9th century AD. The Danube Valley Civilization and Ancient Language 7,500 years before today, civilization rose in Central and Eastern Europe. They are known today as the Danubian culture, a name coined by Australian archaeologist Ver Gordon Child. The ancient culture is known more casually as the Danube Valley Civilization. It's believed they were the first society in Europe to practice agriculture. The civilization sprouted in the East, but soon their methods of farming spread into the West until they reached what is now France. They cleared entire forests, cultivated soil, and figured out how to domesticate animals. It's believed this mysterious group of people came straight from caveman ancestors. They were the descendants of men and women who had been canoodling with Neanderthals just a few thousand years earlier. The Danube Valley civilization was not the only group of Europeans steadily advancing in the days of the Stone Age. There was also the Cardium pottery culture to the south, the Eastern Linear ceramic culture to the east, and the late Funnel Beaker culture in Scandinavia. And don't forget the Windmill Hill culture in South England. What set the Danubians apart was their organization and sophistication. They domesticated cows, dogs, and goats. They also invented a tool that's been found across their ancient territory. Scientists call it a shoe last Celt. It was like a mixture between an axe and a scythe, used for everything from killing an enemy to felling trees. I could go on all day about the complexities of Danube Valley civilization. They were some of the first people, maybe the very first people, to build two-story houses in Europe. They had furniture, they wove, processed leather, and may have invented the wheel. They also had their own religion and social structure. But one of the more interesting aspects is their alleged written language. Harald Harman with the Institute of Archaeomythology is a leading specialist in ancient scripts. He firmly supports the idea that the Danube script is the oldest writing in the world. Tablets have been found dating to 5500 BC. The tablets are inscribed with geometric figures and symbols that appear to be written words. Nobody knows what the writing says, but one thing is for sure. The writing predates all other known languages in the world. The Ikma Culture 900 years ago, the Ikma culture appeared on the edge of the Rimac River south of modern-day Lima in Peru. They were an interesting group of people who lasted about 300 years. Then, in 1469, they were obliterated by the Inca Empire. Much of their history was lost. But archaeologists have been able to piece together some bits about the mysterious culture. They likely spoke Aymara, a popular language in South America a thousand years ago. They also most likely came to inhabit the coastal areas around Lima after the collapse of another ancient civilization not many people have heard of. The Wari Empire had ruled much of Peru for a very long time. When they collapsed around 1000 AD, it had an effect like when the Roman Empire collapsed in Europe 500 years earlier. Small kingdoms and confederations rose from the ashes, there was anarchy, and there was war. When the dust settled, the Ikma culture was in control of the southern lands. The Chanke culture reigned supreme in the hilly regions north of Lima. The Ichma ruled from their capital of Pachacamac. It would have been a truly marvelous city to behold in its heyday. Pachacamac was home to at least 16 monumental pyramids. There were great temples that crowded the skyline, with shamans and high priests holding ceremonies to venerate Pachacamac, the god of creation. Just a little while ago, archaeologists were informed of an amazing discovery. A new pipeline was being put in near Lima when workers came across a tomb. Within the tomb were some human remains, bundled in cloth and tied tightly with rope. The human remains were dumped in a pit roughly 500 years ago. Researchers think the burial was part of an Ichma ritual right before they were defeated by the Inca. Origins of the Etruscans The story of the Ichma and the Inca is one as old as time. It's mirrored in the much more ancient story of the Etruscans and the Romans. Just like the Ichma, the Etruscans were a powerful civilization that got absorbed by their unstoppable neighbors. In the earliest history of civilization in Italy, the Etruscans were the dominating force. They controlled Rome with an iron fist, but fell to the wayside when the real Romans grew too powerful. They remain a mystery today because it's unclear where the fascinating empire came from. Even with all the technology scientists have at their disposal, the Etruscan language has never been fully deciphered. There are dozens of inscriptions that could give full details into the nooks and crannies of Etruscan life, but scientists can't figure out what any of the inscriptions mean. 
What you might find surprising is that even ancient scholars were baffled by the Etruscans. The ancient Greeks pondered over it and so did the Romans in the centuries after the Etruscans were gone. One of the earliest surviving records is from Herodotus in the 5th century BC. He claimed, or rather speculated, that the Etruscans came from Turkey. He said there was a famine in the days prior to the Trojan War, which drove a huge number of people out of Turkey. The starving people settled in Italy and started their own civilization. A second popular theory is that the Etruscans came from somewhere in northern Europe. In the 1st century AD, Pliny the Elder suggested they came from somewhere in the snowy lands beyond. But this was based on little more than myth and folklore. Scholars 2,000 years ago believed there was a land called Etruria. The third popular theory is that the Etruscans didn't come from anywhere. They were indigenous to Italy, having been in the region for thousands of years before the invention of human society. Roman historian Halicarnassus in the 1st century BC believed in this theory. This is also the most popular theory among modern scholars. Scientists think there were multiple cultures existing in small pockets across Italy. For example, the Villanovan culture that's even older than the Etruscans. Try to imagine a dozen different tribes across Italy, then gradually the tribes become stronger and stronger. As this happened, the growing tribes fought for territory. The Etruscans became the most powerful in Italy around 700 BC, but they had competition from their neighbors, the Romans. It's highly probable that both the Romans and the Etruscans originated from indigenous tribes. But alas, there could be only one. The Romans, like a great gelatinous beast, absorbed the Etruscans the Minoans. On the Greek island of Crete, a Bronze Age civilization emerged in the year 2600 BC. They are known today as the Minoans, their name originating from mythical king Minos. He was the one whose wife gave birth to the Minotaur, which Minos locked in a subterranean labyrinth and fed young maidens. And while the Minotaur might be a myth, the civilization certainly is not. The Minoans are famous today for a whole host of impressive things. They made beautifully colored frescoes. Their culture was extremely sophisticated for its time. People wandered the streets in bright clothing and told captivating stories. Some scholars have even suggested the tale of the Minotaur came from a real-life bull cult that dominated the island. Forgetting about monsters for a moment, the most impressive part about Minoan civilization was their bureaucracy. They had palaces and government buildings that would make Washington, D.C. look like a lawless wasteland. The Minoans were also unique in that women enjoyed a much freer lifestyle than women in other ancient societies. Women were able to hold important positions in religious institutions and often were the head of their own clans. These days, the island of Crete is one of Greece's greatest archaeological treasures. Researchers have uncovered an actual palace that may have belonged to King Minos. They've even found some suspicious ruins of what may have once been an underground maze. Though whether it ever contained a half-man, half-bull monstrosity is yet to be seen. The World Civilization, Tamana An eccentric but strangely convincing researcher from Hawaii has made a shocking announcement. Dr. Vomos Toth Bator claims there was once a universal civilization. By universal, the doctor means a civilization that dominated the entire globe. Bator claims the civilization came to an end when a flood devastated the planet, the very flood mentioned in the Bible. It's called Tamana, and proof of it can be found from Bolivia to Timbuktu. Bator, who hails from Hungary, became convinced of a global civilization over a decade ago. He started noticing the name Tamana on a close variation of it all over the globe. He found, after extensive searching, places named Tamana in over 24 countries. For example, the Tamuna River in northern Ontario near the Hudson Bay. The doctor quickly grew convinced that Tamana was a word used by an ancient civilization that spanned the globe. In Bato's mind, Tamana is like the suffix Stan. I'm sure you've noticed that places such as Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan all end in Stan. That's because in Persian, Stan means where one stands. It's used as a suffix in the same way English people use land. For example, England, Scotland, Ireland, Iceland, Greenland. Bato's theory is that Tamana was used in the same way tens of thousands of years ago. It's an exciting theory, but one that doesn't have a lot of supporters. Other than the name Tamana being found around the globe, there isn't much evidence of a civilization that dominated the entire planet. What are your thoughts on this bizarre coincidence? Let me know in the comments below and hit that subscribe button while you're at it. The Sao and the Hyksos 
In the vast expanse of Central Africa between the modern regions of Nigeria and Cameroon, there once roamed a race of giants. According to local legends, the mysterious Sao civilization was the earliest culture to prosper in Central Africa, plus they were giants. It's really the part about being giants that catches people's attention. But who were the Sao really? They could have been giants for all you or I know, their history is extremely murky. Scientists believe they flourished starting in the 6th century BC, but it's unclear. Because of the sad lack of written records, nothing is known about the Sao that isn't myth, rumor, or speculation. Archaeologists don't even know much about their beliefs, traditions, or politics. Modern ethnic people in Cameroon, Chad, and Nigeria known as the Kotoko claim to be descendants of the giant Sao. But even they don't have much useful information to help solve the mystery of their own origin. One theory is that the Sao were old conquerors of ancient Egypt. In Egypt's 15th dynasty, between 1650 and 1550 BC, the nation was ruled by a group of people known as the Hyksos. The name translates to mean rulers of foreign lands. They were so important, they even show up in the Bible. However, scholars are baffled as to where the Hyksos came from or how they even managed to conquer Egypt. It's believed they came from somewhere in the east. They may have come from the Levant, somewhere near modern Israel. Or they may have been Canaanites who took over southern Egypt. Whatever the case, they were foreigners who controlled the southern half of Egypt from the city of Avaris. For a hundred years, they coexisted with the Egyptian rulers to the north, based in Thebes. But then they were crushed. The Hyksos were defeated in 1532 BC, and Egypt was united. In the centuries following their defeat, the Egyptians portrayed the Hyksos as bloodthirsty rulers who tried to oppress the locals. They never mentioned where exactly they went. Now modern scholars are thinking the Hyksos traveled into Central Africa upon their defeat. Then they started the Sao civilization. From the 6th century BC until the 16th century AD, the Sao Empire was an unstoppable force. They left no written records behind, but they did leave behind artifacts. There are quite a few Sao artifacts that depict them as a genuinely artistic group of people. They had a knack for making terracotta statues of bizarre humanoid figures. But what about their demise? The civilization was likely absorbed into the Kanem Empire, yet another magnificent kingdom of Africa. The Sao may never have been truly destroyed, just enveloped to the point they lost their cultural identity. The Yangshao Culture The ancient history of China is a difficult thing to try and make tangible. China is such a huge place that it was almost certainly populated by hundreds of unique cultures. But there was one culture a little more impressive than the others. The Yangshao culture emerged 7,000 years ago on the edge of the Wai River in the north. Scientists believe it to be, potentially, the earliest settled culture in the country. This civilization was big, spread over a massive area in what are now the provinces of Hainan, Shaanxi, and Shaanxi. Archaeologists discovered the first site in 1921. Since then, over a thousand archaeological sites associated with the civilization have been discovered. Some of the more famous ones you may have heard of include the Bampo site and the Jiangzai site. Just like the Danube Valley civilization in Europe, the Yangshao were likely responsible for inventing agriculture in China. Evidence has shown they produced wheat, rice, and soybeans. They also kept the same kind of animals as the early farmers in Europe did. They had cattle, sheep, dogs, and pigs. And like all the other great civilizations of the early world, the Yangshao shaped and painted pottery. They designed weapons, crafting arrowheads from polished stone. The civilization didn't go extinct in the traditional sense of the word. They simply faded over time as they transformed from a Stone Age culture into more advanced societies. The River People of the Amazon For a very long time, scientists assumed the Amazon River Basin was devoid of urbanized society until Spanish colonizers arrived in the 15th century. But then scientists were proven wrong. It turns out there was an exceptional civilization that dominated the Amazon floodplains during ancient times. These people transformed and reshaped the Amazon with their blood, sweat, and tears. They are known as the Kasarabi, the river people of northern Bolivia. Twenty years ago, archaeologist Heiko Prumas from the University of Bonn traveled to Bolivia. He excavated a pair of mysterious earthen mounds, not entirely sure what he would find. It turned out the mounds were heavily eroded pyramids. The locals thought they were nothing but piles of dirt, but they were the foundations of seriously old pyramids. 
This was the first of many discoveries relating to the Kasurabi civilization. Heiko continued his investigation, soon uncovering proof of a sprawling culture. All through North Bolivia is evidence of ancient farmland. Scientists now know the Kasurabi farmed and took care of animals. They also built flood control systems to protect themselves from the Amazon's mighty rivers. They were also surprisingly complex. Cities separated by hundreds of miles traded with one another, forming a massive landscape over what scientists used to think was an untamable wilderness. I'm going to blow your mind even harder now. Prior to the arrival of Europeans in 1492, the tropical rainforests of Bolivia were not a pristine wilderness. Humans had already been changing the forests for 10,000 years. Then, 3,000 years ago, complex societies developed. More recent investigations, including using lasers to scan the jungle, have revealed upwards of 20,000 archaeological remains. Scientists are now starting to understand that humans really did alter the landscape on a dramatic scale. They cleared woodlands, moved mountains, and expanded their territory. The big mystery is that by the time the Europeans arrived, all these people were gone. It's unclear where the river people of Bolivia went, they sort of just disappeared. Which of these mysterious civilizations did you find the most fascinating? Do you enjoy the Neolithic people, or are the more modern civilizations more your style? Let me know in the comments, and thanks so much for watching! Be sure to hit that subscribe button and come back soon for more awesome videos from the channel!